everybody go ahead and introduce yourself and the floor. Hi there. My name's Frank Rodensky, uh, firefighter. I don't know if you call that kind of firefighter, but uh, my buddy Jason's been after me for a long time for an interview, and I just kind of feel uh, very humbled to do this because I don't know. Sometimes I don't think I'm my. I was worthy of it. My thing was I never felt like I was above anybody. I was just like the guy that was um, just like the everyday guy. Go in and do your job. You didn't look for the praise on your back, the slap on your back. Hey, you did this and that. You just went about doing your thing. Um, but my interest in the fire company got started with my grandfather. Grew up in Enhut, which is what our township. Dolphin County, well, I had all that stuff in there just to make sure. Uh, grandfather's grocery store was right beside the firehouse. And uh, as a young kid, my brother Joey and I would go up to my mom's room when the siren blow during the night and look and see, you know, that big red shiny truck going out there with that bubblegum red light going around. <laughs> um, it was just a fascination. It was just something about little boys' fire trucks. You know, it's just something they like. Got hooked. Yes. And then uh, that time frame, that was back in the 60s, that as far as I could remember, come Saturday, 12 o'clock was a siren test. So grandfather would leave the store, my grandma would be in there, and I don't know, she and German would kind of shake the knuckles or something. <laughs> but grandpa would go over there, if there's nobody, he'd start the engine up, turn the radio on, and the county would go down through all the stations. And we were uh, D42, D for Dolphin County. And D42, and Grandpa would key the mic, D42 10 4 meant that the yeah. siren blew because there wasn't a lot of radioactivity and you didn't have all that stuff, not like we're going through nowadays. And as a little kid, you know, I'd go back over there with Grandpa, then back into the store. But that was my time, you know, to um, get the drift of the fire truck or to be close to it or just to see this big shiny red fire truck there. Uh, a couple years then after that, fire company decided to add a um, program. They called it the Sparkies. <laughs> Nowadays, yeah, yeah. Nowadays, um, they're junior firefighters. Back then it was Sparkies. So I so said, how long are you in this? You know, and you had to be 16 to join a fire company. And then the older guys would bust your chops and say, okay, yeah, after a Sparky, then you become a flame. Yeah, and like you're the big guy. But um, started that when I was 14. So I recruited some young guys. Um, some buddies. Yes, kids I grew up with, you know, to be involved in a fire company. It was a way to help the community out. Uh, the firehouse was kind of the hub. Everybody kind of worked around that. You didn't have Sunday store hours. Uh, things were closed on Sundays, so firehouse was the hub. That's where everything went, you know, to sell on Christmas trees. Now, prior to that, they used to have bazaars and stuff, but that was before my time. I know my dad was involved and they would, uh, mom had told me, dad was involved with that and they would have the bazaars and stuff there. But I got some guys to come up through there. Matter of fact, some of my recruits, some people might even know, uh, Scott Simonetti was one, Stevie Miller was one, uh, oh, Mike Lucas, but Mike never got on the job or got big. Um, oh God, Davey Militix. I mean, I had a variety of kids that we, uh, you know, we tried to recruit. Yeah. Kind of keep them off the street. It was a good club. It was, yeah. Our fundraisers were selling uh, multicolored pens. <laughs> we helped. Markers. No, it was pens, no <laughs> markers. They didn't have those markers there. I don't know anything about those markers. They didn't have markers then. But we would sell pens and we would help the fire company. Another fundraiser was for the fire company was to sell calendars. And the other ones we had were a uh, placard that you'd put quarters in and then it would be your donation to the fire company. Mm. So come roll around June, uh, two years passed and then I was 16 and they knew automatically and I'd never thought of that, that they were putting me into the fire company. So uh, first Monday of the month, 7.30 was the meeting, 7.15, that was a big thing, man. When I became a member, you got to go out and hit the siren. You gave it two short blasts and that let everybody know, meeting night, Monday night. 
So I thought, man, I was the kingpin here. I got to blow the sign without getting in trouble. Nobody's going to be chasing me down. So then I became a uh, considered a uh, full-fledged member of the fire company. And I think that evening, I not realizing that uh, I was voted in, I was down the street on my bicycle talking to a girl, and they had a fire call, and I told that girl I had to leave. I got to go see what it was. Pedaled up there, and they say, hey, you're a member, but you're late. You missed the rigs. So we had a little utility, a Chevy Apache. Oh, it was early 60s. Uh, I thought that was the the shit, man, you get on that thing. But I didn't even have gear. I had shorts on, sneakers, t-shirt, and I jumped in, and it was uh, down over the hill on Moon Street. It was probably a smells and bells. It didn't really amount to anything, but brought me back, and uh, now you're a member, and gave me a locker, three-quarter boots, three-quarter coat, Flynn Flex helmet, fireball gloves, and, uh, you know, I was set to go. No Nomex hoods. We didn't know anything about that. We didn't know anything about the leather gloves. You know, fireball, they're going to keep your hands dry if your hose is wet. Yeah. But they don't work too well when you're inside there, and yeah. it gets a little on the warm side, and they start to stick to you. So, um, yeah, now I became a member of the company. So I thought I was the kingpin. And then that really wanted me to recruit some other guys that I knew, that I ran around with, excuse me, that I could get involved in a fire company. I was in probably a year or two before my older brother George uh, decided he wanted to join. So I'd tell him about stuff we would do and you know, going on calls and nowadays it would be frowned on, but at 17, uh, you know, I was packing up, going into buildings and we only had two packs, so you either had to fight for it and you, you missed your, if you missed the station, you just jumped on the engine. We had six pair, six sets of gear on the engine, helmets, pants, and coats. But normally somebody jumped on and started to grab the boots. Uh, the other guy will grab a coat. So you'd be there with the helmet and boots, but no coat. <laughs> so it was uh, kind of a mishmash of uh, crap, to say the least. But uh, I explained things, what was going on, and George decided he'd like to try it. Yeah. So George joined, and then uh, my brother Joe come up to it and stepped up to the plate, and he joined. So it was the three Rodenskys running there. And uh, it created a little hate and discontent. I'm sure. Because three brothers, I don't know if they felt threatened, but um, we could look at each other, and you didn't have to say anything. We'd get on calls, and it was just a click. You knew exactly who had to do what. Yeah. Uh, and we just went about our... Uh, went about our business to do what we had to do. Didn't sit there for uh, selfies and photos and all this stuff. Uh, did our job, mopped up, cleaned up, you know, and left. Yeah. So at that point in time, that was probably shortly thereafter, then they appointed captains, because at that point in time, we only had a chief and two assistants, first and second assistant chief. So they wanted to try something with a captain and a lieutenant, and I was the first captain there that they appointed. That was under Albert Majestic was our fire chief. What what time, what this would have been what year? Oh, Early seventies. Early seventies, yes. No, it had to be. I'm sorry, mid seventies, because I got in in seventy. What was it? Seventy two. Because I had to be of age, I had to be 16, so 18. Yeah. 73, 74, because I helped 72 flood. Actually, I was a Sparky. I'm back up there. I was a Sparky during the 72 flood, so I couldn't go with the company. Uh, 73, I became a member, so I could help. 74, 75, 76, in that time frame. I was a captain, and then uh, I held the office of second assistant chief when I was there. George was a uh, George was also an officer too, and uh, <laughs> we had two radios. The chief had one, and the assistants would share it, so we'd fight. <laughs> but one thing special about that time frame that I have to um, kind of think about, and 
never thought of it till probably six, seven years ago, to be honest with you. Uh, George, Joe, and I were still living at home. Two sisters were still living at home. Uh, whistle would go off. We had a scanner at that time, but whistle would go off, no pages or any of that. And mom would faithfully get up, turn the lights on, come downstairs, turn the light on in the living room, and open the front door so us three could boom, 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 run out up over the banister down the street and uh, run a half a block to the firehouse. Never gave much of a thought, you know, with mom, you know, doing all that. Um, just kind of, um, you know, thanked her and appreciated, hey, you know, mom, thanks for doing that stuff there. Yeah, but stuff that we kind of took for granted, but never knew really how mom felt. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, dad died young, so she had seven of us to raise. And there uh, goes three of her boys. Yeah. So she would often talk about dad. Now dad, you know, the fires were a lot different back in the 40s and 50s when dad was really involved. And um, I never gave it a thought until my brother's uh, boys got in the fire service, which was uh, Andrew and Glenn Rodensky. And I was after Joe, because the one year George, Joe, and I did a picture for my mom and gave it to her for Christmas with us on the old GMC from uh, our fire company. So I finally talked these guys into doing a picture. And it was Emily's, Glenn's sister, my niece, Glenn's, uh, Glenn's sister. It was her graduation. It was during the summer. And I said, you were doing this picture. We're doing it in gear. And this was, I don't know, June, July, 90 degrees. So I had this brainstorm. OK, we're going to go to Cleona Station. They'd bring out their engine. We'd do this picture. Now, we dress up in gear. I mean, we're soaked. Matter of fact, the picture is there on the, uh, my little memorial corner. We're doing this picture, and we're sweating our nuts off. So we got a couple months ahead of time that we could get this ready. We're going to give it to my mom for Christmas. George worked some stuff out. Joe, we got a nice size picture there, made it up, framed it for mom. And I said, I want everybody on the back of that identify who you are and what office or what title you held during your career you know your service in the fire company so everybody did this so we figured you know the young bucks andrew and glenn can give it to mom here for christmas and uh, that kind of touched me when i gave it to her because i never thought of our time when george joe and i went running out there and uh, mom unwrapped it and she just started crying it's probably one of the few times I've seen my mom cry, and she made a comment. She says, now that I have to start worrying all over again because of Andrew and Glenn. And I never, I never thought of it that way. And um, when we're young, we're invincible. We're going to live forever. But as you get older, you learn to appreciate little things. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really touched me that I never knew I gave my mom such heartache and headache because... When she heard my name over the radio one time, they were taking me in the ambulance. I was in a collapse, and uh, I got some ammonia freon gas. It was just Colin Steelton. Uh, I'm sure that put everything back into perspective for Mom, and now she's got to worry about Andrew and Glenn. But uh, knock on wood, all things, all things worked out well. Yeah. So, uh, what was our next adventure? George and I. We had this rambunction that uh, we wanted to become involved in the city. We knew a couple of guys that ran up at 13, and uh, Zach, Rich Zach Rush was a member of our company at Enhut, and his brother-in-law was Jack Payne. Jack Payne and he asked, you know, old BBI's mm -hmm. number 76 on the job. So we decided we were going to put an application in, and that was 76 it's for the camp, camp curtain. curtain, yes. So George and I, filled the paperwork out, sent it in, and uh, waited a month, you know, to hear about the meeting, and uh, lo and behold, it was one of these things I never heard of. We got blackballed. I said, what's this? And they said, you were blackballed, you know, you weren't accepted as a member. You can wait six months and reapply. And I'm thinking, blackballed? I said, it's nothing like what's going on nowadays. You know, the young kids come up through, they feel like they're owed everything oh, yeah. you know give them a whole set of gear you know pager 
you know, wipe her ass for him or take, do whatever you got to do for him. But uh, it's a different time frame. So it was kind of a rude awakening. And I thought, okay, I'm going to just keep myself here at Enhut. We were both so involved, you know, be active. And um, we'll wait our six months. Uh, roundabout way, we met up with a Bill Hoyer because Bill was running up there. And his grandfather was uh, Pat Hoyer, which was a retired firefighter in the city. And then they, he was also the president there at that time. So we talked to him what we need to do, and he said, you know, you could reapply. So come March of 77 uh, is when we reapplied, and uh, lo and behold, we got accepted this time. So <laughs> singing, all right, now here we go. We're going to be big city boys. But it did stir the pot back at Enhut, because then uh, we would leave to go uptown there for their fires. And what happens if we have a fire here, or there's something happening here? I said, well, there's days we got to go to work. You know, we're not there when we're at work, so just pretend we're at work. I wanted a little more adventure. I wanted the, um, you know, busyness. I wanted, yeah. you know, the excitement. Uh, back then, now they're referring to it as the, um, the war years. And I can kind of feel kind of fortunate that I was a little involved with that because um, we had some shit back in the day, and it was kind of rude and awakening for me. I was a young kid, wet behind the ears. I had a Philly helmet that I had this brainstorm as a young kid running as a volunteer at Enhut that uh, I had a friend of mine put the scotch light on and put flames on it, thinking, you know, I'm going to be a flame because I was a sporky, now I'm a flame. So this kind of continued on. Well, first time I took that helmet in the city, and I was up 13, because then they didn't issue your gear. They wanted you to see if you're going to come around. Right. If you're going to come around, then we'll think about giving you gear, but you took your own gear. So I went up there, and the captain was Billy Zimmerman, and he said, um, can I see you here a minute? He said, um, Bill, great dude, being just a good guy, uh, kind of a dry sense of humor. You got to earn his respect, and yeah. you know, it took a little while to get to really know him, but his intentions were for all the right reasons. And he said, hey, we don't do this kind of stuff here. I don't know what you do back in the townships, wherever you come from. He said, but that kind of helmet isn't acceptable. You either get another helmet or take them off. So I said, uh oh, here we go. I didn't want to ruin, I didn't want to ruin my flames. But then I said, hey, I got this young brother named Joe. I said, uh, Joe, when I go in the city, I'm going to borrow your helmet. You can use mine. Same heads. You know, we can fix that. Boom, bing, bada, boom. The only thing, he had his orange initials on the back. JR. I said, okay. Hey, man, I'm good to go. Well, lo and behold, ran some calls. We get on the general alarm fire. The guy's from eight there. Guess who's there? This guy named JR. These guys, I didn't see him in there. We were in there overhauling at this... Um, house fire we were at was a row home we were overhauling and here in the corner sitting is buck jr i think modica might have been with him tommy murray these guys are sitting in there you know not enough smoke they're in there getting the smoke and jr hollers not saying his name goes hey who's jr and i said that's me what's up he said there's only one jr in the city and he said that's me and i thought man <laughs> shut down twice here we go and I gave him a quick spiel of who the JR was, my brother. I said, I had another helmet, but I couldn't wear it. Um, so they kind of chuckled and um, yeah, but it was, you, uh, it was a way to learn, earn or learn, earn your respect for these guys. You know, they wanted to see if you were really made of what you were made of, you know, and if you could do the job. And we'll fast forward a little bit there because that stuck with me for all these years. And it wasn't prior, probably the summer before JR passed away, he was up at Pump Primers and he was walking around with Dick Gray. And he was also walking with his wife and son. And I was up there with my buddy Scott Simonetti and we were right there at front and uh, there at the Harvey Taylor Bridge. No, I'm sorry, Market Street Bridge. And I said, hey, I said, do you have a second? I said, this story has been haunting me for many years. I said, but it's something you instilled in me and made me want to, you know, to strive and do my best. I said the story with the JR on a helmet and he just kind of chuckled and laughed. He said, man, that's one. He said, I don't know if I remember. I said, but it's something 
that I remembered and that I never wanted to copy you. I never knew all about JR until I got running in the city or Buck, uh, Tommy Murray, you know, Modica, Maker. You know, it was one of these deals. You looked up to those guys. I mean, those guys were the shit, but there was always a little button head between the guys from 13 and eight. We always had that, but it was always a respect thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we shook hands and I said, I'm glad, you know, that JR, I said, I got a chance to tell you that. I said, you know, cause I looked up to you guys and I said, you know, you taught me things. I said, you probably didn't even realize you taught yeah. me, but as a young kid, and that time frame, when we were going in, we had a row home of five houses off. We pulled up with four guys. Guess what? We each had our own house and maybe the paid man, once he gets the hydrant hooked up until everybody else is getting there, he might have hit the one. So that means we had to flake our line. And we're going in by ourselves, so you're taking your own tools. You're going to start hooking, you're going to hit the fire. Drop your line hook, and you got to just re regroup. And then hopefully, uh, yeah. you know, if one of the chiefs are going to call you know, for some second or third alarm. But if you had bonnets, oh my buddy, the screaming eagle, you know what it was? 10-12, 10-12. That meant he could handle with what's on the, on the street. And uh, he made you work. Oh, yes. Um, he gave us the respect, even though we were volunteers. He respected what we did, but he knew, he knew our limitations or what we could do. And that was the way that you were definitely going to better yourself and do what you needed to okay. do. But yes, you would hump. Now some of the other chiefs would automatically call, you know, Banger was favorite for that. You know, he'd call, give me the threes. Rydell, yeah. But Mike, the Screaming Eagle, he was uh, one of a kind. Just, just a super, super, super good guy. Yes. But uh, yeah, it taught you a lot. It taught you a lot. We had some shitty calls. We had some good calls. But um uh, yeah, with the JR, I definitely wanted to get that out there because uh, <laughs> it was kind of a, you know, an eye opener. Yeah. But you made you appreciate things, and I'm glad I got to yeah. tell that story. You know, at least get at least talk to him before he passed because um, he was a special person, just yeah. a good guy. But the friendships made along the way, yeah. Uh, I mean, we had the Dutchman, Ragmore, Shag, Nasty, that be Hedrick, George. And um, Flapper, Steve Risser. That dude, you could not look at him and keep a straight face. His helmet would be half cocked and he'd be wanting to go somewhere and he looks like the eyes were going this way and Flapper's helmet was facing that way. But if you give him a Schmitz, we just talk things over and hey, we were good to go. Uh, and then we had the black cat, Ben Newsom, uh, which was two great guys that we had, you know, the black... Uh, black guys that we had there. Bobby Jenkins worked on a tower too, uptown. And uh, Ben was one of our drivers there at 13, but just a great guy. We used to call him the zebra. First time I walked in the bunk room, I looked over and seen this big black ass and he slept with the jock. So you've seen this black ass and these two white stripes. And they said, that's the zebra. And I'm thinking, <laughs> this day and age, you know, you got to be politically correct, and I was never politically correct. Yeah, firemen usually uh, aren't. No, because my buddy Chuck Stafford there, when he was chief, he didn't want me to have that radio after I dropped the F-bombs a couple times. He was not happy at that. But Ben um, never looked at it that way. Uh, we chewed red man together, and we'd always, I'd rouse him, I'd say, you have any black man? <laughs> and uh, we'd carry it on the rig, and, we made it up where we put the um, sassafras in there. We'd carry a sleeve underneath the front seat of the engine. Yeah. Our old engine uptown, the Mac. And uh, we'd make it up so we'd have a chew. You'd get a good working fire, you'd get a, put a chew in. But Ben, um, I mean, we got to be really good friends. I did some work for him at his house uptown. He lived on 4th Street. Uh, he was actually at my wedding. So he was like family. And my bachelor's party, he went to cuss me there and him and Hedrick because uh, he was kind of kicked back, relaxed, laying on the recliner in our house there in the backyard in Enhut. 
kind of just relax and had some beers and just sitting there. And I said, we need to liven this up. So I got my pistol. And I keep saying it was another pistol. Hedrick said it was a 357. Living in Enhart in the row homes, you know, yards weren't very big and that kind of stuff wasn't really acceptable. So I said, we're going to liven this up. And pow, 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 I start shooting through the yard. Ben rolled off the thing that shit went flying. Hedrick's trying to grab me. And I'm just saying, come on, we got to have fun. And yeah. <laughs> kind of um, Jack Payne, yeah, Rick Moore, those guys. Yeah, and that's sad. That's, uh, I got to kind of reflect there because those guys are no longer with me. And uh, they were just uh, really good friends, just uh, some great people. But we never played the race card. We just did our thing. We had Pete Daring. I won't use that other name, but we had Pete. Oh, okay. And he was... Yes, we'll just go with that other run. But Pete was a uh, Pete was a member up there at the Camp Curtain, and he lived down the street. And I believe that was on Camp Street that he lived. But um, you want to talk? Good things about Pete. You want to talk about a bull working? Now he wouldn't be the guy to go inside. But whatever you needed done outside, throwing ladders, hoses, um, he was just your go-to guy. And what helped us when we'd have fires in them uh, uptown areas like that. He knew some of the people. Well, he knew how the people. So he was kind of our ace in the hole. Right. We could go talk to some of these people. Hey, we're here to help you. We're here to prevent, excuse me, we're here to prevent, you know, your house is from burning down. We're here to, you, you know, it's a help for you. Mm -hmm. He said, you get back in and get the hell out of here. He had a couple other syllables and stuff, but uh, we'll, just, we'll just leave it at that. But uh, he knew a good way, too, how to get under the pay guy's skin. He'd come up and he said, I have your job. I'm going downtown. I'm going to see the mayor. <laughs> he just liked to wind him up. But to see, that's why the pay guys cost pops, because we pop in, pop out. <laughs> wind him up, pop in, pop out. And uh, they'd be saying, yeah, okay, you smart asses. Hey, we'd wind him up a little bit. But Pete, uh, just, a great, just a great human being, good guy. Uh, just a rough life, hard worker, never wanted much, uh, but he was always there to give his all. We'd always have him um, for our banquets, or not our banquets, we'd actually have get-togethers. The city allotted us $400 a month. So that could buy us um, supplies and stuff there at the station. So come Christmas, I'm sorry, Thanksgiving first and then Christmas, we'd get together and we'd have turkey dinners. I mean, we'd have, we have the spread. Normally when you had Santora working was a good cook, or Jack Payne, yeah. old BB I a ski would always ski be busting his nuts about shit. Yeah, yeah, that time now. He'd go there, Jack's bad his eyes were that bad. Jack, I love you, buddy, apologize, so don't take it the wrong way. But they first time he got his contacts, he'd go to pop them out, they go bam, bang on the table. They go, Holy hell, what are you dropping out? Coke bottle bottoms. <laughs> but um, yeah, they fed us. So we'd have uh you know, Pete and all those guys would get together. You know, most of the guys that didn't always come around, we'd still have a group together. So it was always a nice setup. You could always count on Zimmy being there because he was a living, Ski being there, Hoyer, Billy Hoyer being there, you know, and what paid guys were working. But, you know, everybody would get together, good cooks. Uh, we wouldn't go away hungry. And we had some Yukon Jack and some Schmitz to add to it there. So we could tell these stories now because there's, yeah, we're not going to get in trouble. Yeah. But the best one was when Jack Payne said to Billy Hoyer, hey, go down there. That was the Wise Market there on 3rd Street, uptown there. And he even gave him a can. We're out of cranberry sauce. Thanksgiving, cranberry sauce. Get some more cranberry sauce. So Bill goes down, comes back. Now Bill had just a little trouble in his high school days and reading and writing and all that comes back and hands the can to Jack Payne. Jack goes, what's this? He says, cranberry. He says, they're red beets. And Bill's excuse was he couldn't read that. He said, well, the can was red. <laughs> so we had red beets instead of cranberry sauce. And that story still comes up from time to time. <laughs> or at least the old guys that remember Hoyer. And uh, yeah, but um, good group. And then we could get to the cut man. That's where uh, George and I first met Stan Malazuski. Stan the cut man, and then we had Mike Beck as a living at that time, and Billy Zimmerman. There was those three. And if there was someone else, I apologize that I 
But those were the three that sticked because they were the ones that made the impression. Beck was kind of a little squirrely. He reminds you of a uh, Fonzie on uh, like Happy Days, slick back hair. You know, but even Billy Zimmerman had that because he had that old Ford. But um, those three guys, uh, they were the regular livings. And uh, Ski, there was just something about him, his way, his demeanor. Uh, Stanley Malazuski came from Philly. He lived in the uh, Fishtown area. His family was always from Philadelphia. Uh, he served a stint in, in, in uh, Vietnam. His story to me was that he had gotten into uh, trouble on and off. And uh, his buddy was John Boy Brannigan. Must have been an Irish kid that grew up right in that same area there. They uh, got in a fair amount of trouble, I guess in their time and uh, the last time they were in front of the judge the judge told them you're either going to jail or you're going in the army and Ski said I looked at John Boy and John Boy looked at me and said we're going in the army uh, signed up went off to Vietnam uh, John Boy never made it home Ski often talked about that was his uh, that was a special buddy and that was I think it something that um, troubled him. It was a you know a good buddy and he realized how quick life was, how short life was. But uh, you know, Ski come back, Ski wandered around, he wrote an article, he did a couple papers uh, from down in Philadelphia, the Fishtown area, the Fishtown there's somewhere that I have it, it was a little paper that they would put out and he wrote articles in there because in his time frame and um, once he left here in Harrisburg when they closed Station 13 and moved down to new station, Station 1 and 2, Ski got on a job in Philly. Now his uh, relatives, he had some uncles that were on a job in Philly and that was always his desire to go back down there. But um, where was I going with that there? He, uh, John Boy and him, I guess got in enough trouble that Ski said, uh, you know, I need to make something on myself. But what he did do is um, he always made a promise. Something happened to him, you know, they wanted to be buried together. And when uh, Ski passed away, I really finally got to meet John Boy's grave. And uh, we processioned from the church, went by his sister's house, and the cemetery is right beside his sister's house. And uh, yeah, he's buried with John Boy. But that is one piece of work. If, um, if we could be a tenth of what he was, as far as a firefighter. I mean, his favorite line was, bada bing, bada boom. He said, yo, Holmes, get it in. Anybody can squirt hose. You got to be a truckie. He said, he was always wanting to better himself or do something. Always wanted to elevate himself, but never thought of himself as above anybody. He always treated you as the same. Um, you know, bottom man, because he was into the boxing part, so he'd come up to you. That was his first round. He'd come up like he wanted to smack you, and uh, but him and I always carried her on. You know, with we had Sunday boxing after. Um, was he actually a cut man? Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's how he got his name. I was figuring it yes. was either from the fire department or I had heard that he was into boxing to some degree. Yes, he was on his days off, and that. Uh, but he always liked the lightweights because he said them dudes fight. He said, not them big guys who want to just lump around in there. He said, little guys want to fight. Ski was a cut man. So he was Ski until he spent more of his time down in Philly on the fire department. That's where he became Stan the cut man. Okay. Um, so here in Harrisburg, everybody just referred to him as Ski. As Ski, yes. Because that was when he was still a volunteer at the Camp Curtain. Until he moved and got on a job there in Philly. He was Ski for there for a while and then it became Stan the cut man. So on his off days... He liked to go to the gym, and he was always into that. Handball was his favorite. He loved to play in handball, uh, but he liked to just, uh, yeah, not jumping jacks with it. Was it the rope? Jump rope. Yeah, jump rope. He jump rope, jump rope. You know, just keep in shape. Yeah. He put weights on his legs and swim in the uh, in the pond or in the pool, just to condition himself for on the job. You know, he's always about. Uh, 
you know, better than himself, yeah. But then he got into hanging around those guys. He got into doing the cut man. The first time I saw him on ESPN2, oh, God, on a Friday night, he'd come out, the, and this was on TV, he'd come out, had a band on his head, and had he looked like an Indian chief. He had all these long Q-tips there ready to go, and he went to work, and he did the cutting. You know, he did repairs. He yeah. he was legit. He was no bullshitter. I mean, he was definitely the real deal. Uh, but as far as flying a stick, and that's what he loved. He loves the sticks. Engine six, ladder 16, that was it, man. He swung, bada bing, bada boom. He said, bang, bang, bang. He said, open up the windows and go to work. His thing was, he'd come up, you know, have a, uh, I don't know, eight, 10 pound sledge on his, on his waist, you know, uh, an iron, and he'd grab a uh, 14, 16 foot roof ladder and he'd go, he'd go to work, he'd take off. He said, if I get up there, I got a way out. You know, I can hang that ladder or drop it off to the other side. And uh, there's so many things that I learned from him just watching as a volunteer when I first met him up with, uh, up at the Camp Curtain. Sometime us young kids needed to do, uh, just shut our mouth and uh, open our eyes and our ears and just, you know, pay attention and just watch and listen. And I wrote him a letter and uh, kind of a thank you. He had given me something and I wrote him a thank you card. And he wrote me one back. He said, yo, Holmes, that's what it, we were always Holmes. Yo, Holmes, he said, I never knew, you know, that I taught you. He didn't want any recognition for it. And I said, no, I said, you needed to know. I said, what you meant to people. I said, you know, just your way, your demeanor. I said, you never thought you were above anybody else. Uh, there's a guy that led a rough life. I mean, there's some stuff here we can't really want to say on the, uh, <laughs> say on the um, interview here, but we'll leave it at that. But he did leave a rough life. But that's what I wanted to do. When I come back from the service, he floated around out in the Midwest some places, slept in the desert, lived off the land. He come back here and he was riding his bicycle, stopped that engine eight. I think at that point in time he was working uh, for the city of Harrisburg. He had hair down to his waist. He said, yo, he said, I heard you guys, you know, take firefighters. He looked at him, you know, up one side down the other. No. He said, you can go up town. There's a place up on 6th Street, Camp Curtain. You can go up there. So he pedaled his bike up there and the story's correct, one of the first people, persons he met there was working at Davis Jack Payne, and Jack was the kind of guy, you know, who would talk to somebody, take somebody in, and uh, yeah, we'll take you. Now, Jack wasn't a, well, yes, he was a member, because a couple of those guys were members of Camp Curtin and also the paid guys. Uh, so Ski joined, so that's how his roundabout and came. Yes. Yeah, and that was for, I'd say five, six years. Also, on the other part of the cut, man, too, he cut hair. Oh, really? Yes, because he actually gave a pair of scissors to my sister, Patty, because she was cutting hair, and she still has them, and uh, they were engraved with ski. Everything wow. had, but yeah, he, well, it's hard to believe, but back there was the time when I actually had a fro, so it was like this big mop. Ski would cut our hair, but we'd give him a couple bucks. He got a, um, he had a barber chair upstairs. How that thing got up in that spiral staircase or whatever, we got it up there. I don't know if it came in through the front window or what. But yeah, he would cut hair. Huh. Yeah. That's pretty cool. There's the one and only, man. The cut man. I just wish there could have been an interview on ski. But um, so far we live and learn. Yeah. Um, shortly after that, I got married. Station one was now our home, and that wasn't always a good thing with the volunteers because we had some older paid guys that um, didn't really appreciate it, and they figured since the house had closed and now there's a more group of paid guys in there and less volunteers, you know, when it was at uh, up at the Camp Curtain, we had two paid guys, you know, and there'd be times we had two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe ten volunteers. the majority. Correct. They were not the majority. So um, we talked about this in, in some of the other interviews, and it's an interesting. Like a lot of people don't realize it. No, they don't. Up, up until up until 1980, there was 14 firehouses, and basically the paid guys were just drivers. Yes. The people 
you know, doing the work and staffing the rigs was the volunteers. Or it was a shit call. You know, you got you got three wagon drivers together. They would just help each other to handle whatever it was, bullshit, and then go back to quarters. But after 1980, they took all those rigs and put them out of service, and they took all those drivers and put two on the trucks, three on the Correct. engines, and that, that was a huge change in the department. That's where, you know, I tell a lot of people, it's where you saw the decline of the volunteers. They they really ran the show up until that point. And then they had four firehouses with all those paid staff. Instead of 14 firehouses, they were in four. Correct. And, you know, that was dynamically, that was a huge shift in the department. I it, can imagine. I mean, it was. Because you had A, B, C, and D. When I first started running at the Camp Curtain, it was just A, B, and C. There was no D shift. So D was added later. Matter of fact, D was added even when I was still at the Camp Curtain, late 70s. Maybe, yeah, late 70s it was that they added the fourth platoon. But to reiterate on that, what you were just saying, uh, now when the volunteers were going down there, I was a captain. So I tried to keep things going. There was few of us that uh, were going around, and I wanted—I didn't want to see us die and dwindle. Eight was always a stronghold. Eight had a good group of guys. Um, they were well represented. They still had their they, house, though. They still had their house. That is correct. But uh, I finagled there with the mayor and the chief that we could get keys and issue them to Station One. So I wanted to set the example. So I started going up. Now, there were certain groups you'd want to ride with and then certain yeah. you didn't want to bother because Hedrick and I were still good friends. Jack Payne, um, Ron Silhammer, Sledge, yeah. Joe Santoro. I mean, we had some good guys. But then sometimes when you had a group of six, eight, ten paid guys and one or two volunteers, it got a little interesting. You know, they started putting stuff in your gear, start jockeying around with stuff, moving stuff around. And there was a couple of times I had a uh, fist confrontation in the back hallway to come in, carrying my gear and, you know, to come in to ride. And he said, what are you doing here? No, you're not. And I said, yeah, I am. And uh, we won't mention the paid guys' names, but yeah, you know how wide the hallway is. So we were bouncing back and forth off the uh, walls in there. And I said, I'm here to ride. So until you put your foot down, established who you were, that you yeah. weren't going to be intimidated. Yeah. But yes, what you talked about, yeah, when you went from 14 down to the four, yeah, it just changed things up. It took a little while and things kind of mellowed out. And then at that point in time, some of these other paid guys were getting older, they can retire. So you had a new younger regime coming in. And some of that younger regime were volunteers that were in the city at that time were running in surrounding areas. So they kind of knew what, uh, you know, what the scenario was kind of like, because they dealt a little bit, but not as much. Plus, they were volunteers at other areas, at other companies, and they could uh, they could kind of relate to it. I said, we're not here to steal your job. We're not here to take your job. You know, we're here to do a job, you know, to help you guys out. Yeah. So, uh, it, it got a little rough. But, uh, yeah, we managed. I'm still here. Uh, <laughs> I was kind of like, I don't know, some guys refer to you like a dickhead or whatever, you know, you just kind of ballsy, but if you didn't establish yourself, and I think that was one thing with running in a city, kind of the way I became as a firefighter, and it was kind of hard for me sometimes to relate the pass orders down, because when we'd go in on the city and we'd have a, you know, a row house going, and we only had four guys and you had three houses off, you know, you weren't there with a the group of guys to go in. So you learn to kind of do the wrong thing where you were going in by yourself. And, uh, you know, that's kind of a no-no now. You know, they want the two in, two out. But there was a job that had to be done. You know, lives, then people didn't matter if there was 50 guys there coming in at one time or one. If they're getting out of the house or they're getting saved, you know, they're going to save her property. You know, that's what they were looking at. And uh, you never looked at color. I never looked at that. I always looked at a human being. Um, I know I was a little rough around the edges if people know me the way I talk sometime or whatever. But to do you, you know, to do your job seriously, yeah. I never looked at that. Because uh, some of the rescues and that I'm involved in, I never, most of them were women, little kids. I never gave that a thought. Uh, I have two daughters. And that was a big thing to me. 
that I wanted to say, hey, if something happens to me or something happens to my daughters, you know, I want somebody to do their all, to get them. you know, to get them. Yeah. But um, that's the expectation. Yes. It, but should there, it should be, but there's some that like to yes. kind of hide behind that. So uh, I kind of got away from things there for a little while when I was married and then the divorce come up upon me and that was kind of a crappy time in my life and I was kind of down and out and uh, my old buddy Jeff Miller Skull was running at High Spire at the time and he said hey you got too much uh, you know wisdom and knowledge do you ever think about joining I said no nah, I never gave it a thought he said why don't you come down here you know, check things out so that was in 96 and in 96 97 uh, I joined down at High Spire so everybody's kind of look at who's this old dude, man. Look at his gear. Look at this guy. He kind of looks kind of yeah, like prehistoric. <laughs> and that that was hard for me at that point in time because I still had that mentality. You know, I'd get off the rig. You know, my mind was running here, but I didn't wait for somebody to say, "Hey, go do this," or grab a couple other guys. Uh, you know, I just went off and running. Uh, you knew what needed done. Yes, but I didn't want to set a wrong example because every, well not everybody, but there's quite a few that yeah. said, I want to go in with you. And I said, no, you don't. Because I said, I don't want to have to worry about somebody else. Yeah. I said, um, no, I said, you know, You're maybe. You're used to operating differently. Yes. Like you've been talking about. Yeah, it was a different time frame. I mean, yeah. what they refer to now as the war years. Uh, you know, there's a lot of fire in that time frame in the 70s. Now there's guys that probably, yeah, you know, they fought a lot more fire than me. I know some of the guys that were eight from up at 13. Yeah, but I could say knock on wood, you know, I was fortunate to get some of that stuff. And you think about it now, how fortunate I was, because what it did for your experience, uh, your knowledge, uh, your self-esteem gave it its self-worth to say, you know, dude, I can do this. We kick his shit in the ass. Because yeah. the red devil doesn't care about anybody, but eating everything up. And if you're not there to put him down, put him in his place, uh, yeah. But anyhow, I got the high spire and uh, they wanted to make me an officer. I said, man, I said, that's like stepping on toes. I said, I just wanted, I wanted to kind of be like the little guy in the back, just, you know, riding along or whatever. But uh, Skull, Pesky, Chuck Stauffer was there at that time. Uh, Zimmerman Brothers, Kevin and Chad, uh, Bud, little Bud, Mike Slode, Slody, because Slode and I share a story that's kind of like, when I look at him, we often think about this, uh, yeah, we just kind of look at each other and kind of like just smile, and we'll leave it at that, because we know what we did that night, and it was a shit call, and just the smells and bells, it went bad, but uh, you had Roy Slasher, Bob Condren, um, and there was a few of the older guys that I had actually ran with when I was at Enhut, and we would get together and do cross training with. Back then, you know, it was kind of hard to believe, but High Spire, uh, Enhut, we'd work with Steelton. Mm -hmm. So there's guys that I got to know from the 70s, and now I'm seeing these older guys. And I thought, man, you know, we never get old. Yeah. I never gave out a thought until, uh, you know, this time passes by, but that was in the 90s. Because um, I know, I, I moved up in 97. I was living in progress. And uh, we were always waiting to go to fucking Steelton. And uh, <laughs> I know uh, 55, when when you guys were down there, you guys were no joke. And uh, I, I'm Bandana Chuck. We were. <laughs> Bandana Chuck. That'll lead up to another story. I was but probably the greatest run of characters at 55 they've ever had. Probably the late 90s. Yeah, but even before that, Steve Weaver was in pretty instrumental. He was a chief at that time. Or, I'm sorry, prior to that, he was a chief. And those guys were like the little kids, like yeah, the yeah. Sparkies back then when I yeah. started. You know, they were the young guys, and Steve cracked the whip. You know, Steve, uh, just a good guy. Yeah. And I think he instilled in some good guys. He instilled in them, All you know, the proper. I mean, Chuck, yeah. Skull Dorkian, yeah. the Hammer, the Polish Hammer, Pesky, I mean. <laughs> Oh, Schwarzdicker. Yeah, Schwarzdicker. Straight killers. Yes. Yeah, Chuck, I don't know. He kind of left us. He got that thing called. Yeah, and he got smelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we kind of kicked us to the curb there. 
Chuck, but, Chuck, we love you. Chuck, yeah. <laughs> Chuck, because that'll lead up to the story with Chuck, how we became buddies. These young kids wanted to play darts. And Chuck said, I'm looking for a partner. I said, I'll throw darts. And I kind of knew Chuck, but I never really knew him. Yeah. So we come in and we start throwing darts and we cleaned out. We cleaned the house with them guys. So he looked, and that was our really, him and I's uh, kind of initiation that we kind of um, introduced each other. Yeah, and we got, yeah, we got along, but he did hate me. <laughs> oh man, he's a fool, did he get pissed on calls? God, especially when he dropped the F-bombs a couple times and then, County T-55 T respond. He said, oh, here we go, the whispers on the radio. You know he's not going to sign on the air or get on the air when he's on the scene, so he'll kind of mill around saying, oh, yeah. Chuck got screwed because he ended up having to take command, and I'd go in to do the work, and, oh, I hosed him a couple times, yeah. <laughs> but the best one was the F-bombs, yeah, when I just kind of slipped out. And, but I got my point across. Everybody got quiet and listened then, but yeah. it's sad that we, it's what we have to do sometimes to get, uh, yeah. you know, to get, Attention. Respect, attention, yes. Chief to Chief 2, meet me at the car now. Yeah. Yeah, so I apologize to him and yeah. But there, uh, I had some rough calls. It was tough for me to, what I had to go through, you know, in my life going through the divorce. Uh, I was really missing my girls, Danny and Jesse. Um, and they became, Uncle or Chuck became known as Uncle Chunk. They just clicked with him and they just really like Chuck. He just had a way with Danny and Jesse and they, he would take us down to sisters and he would go fishing and we'd fish together. And uh, we just become, yeah, just like a good family. And to this day, Danny often say, how's Uncle Chunk, you know? <laughs> I said, I haven't seen Uncle Chunk, he's busy. <laughs> but uh, we had a crap call one night and uh, I was getting back to my buddy Slody. It was an apartment down there and it was another investigation. And uh, two story, but they were split. So you had a set of steps to go up and you had a doorway. You had two doors, but one door would take your second floor apartment. The other door was first floor apartment. And they're going, oh, we got the smoke and odor. And I said, man, something ain't right here. And I said, you guys are looking at the wrong thing. And they were over. And I kind of looked at this doorway, like I'm looking at this doorway in the big picture window. And I did a quick wipe and saw the soot there. I said, slow, this is it. I said, take the door. Because there was a guy that was supposedly, that belonged in that apartment or in that complex, but was not there. He wasn't around, his car was there. Mike hit the door and uh, I dropped to my knees, put my mask on and uh, went in and uh, there he was, right behind the door. I grabbed him. Uh, we can be fortunate that we didn't have a flash. I don't know, it just smoldered. He fell asleep on the uh, couch. Woke up to the smoke. He was trying to climb to the door. He got right there to that area that close and just on the other side. My buddy slowly popped the door. I yanked him out. Mike dropped down. And uh, that's one thing Mike and I will share because uh, he started mouth to mouth and his skin stuck to Mike. and. Uh, it was just one of those deals. Uh, yeah, it's one of the cards that the good Lord sent us and uh, just wasn't in our favor. But the ironic twist with that, that guy there looked exactly like a guy I worked with at work. That was a Saturday night call. Uh, Sunday they had a group come down to talk to us. The kind of... Um, discuss the call, you know, like a debriefing. Back when I started, I had some shit calls. We never did that. You know, you went in your room. You didn't think about it. No, well, you did think about it, but you went in well, your room. Well, other turned... people didn't think about it. No. It wasn't, it wasn't no. a thing. We had a debriefing here for Sunday and um, went to work Monday and come around the corner in the garage, go in there and Bobby would come out the door and Bobby looked just like this guy. And I tell you what, it just scared, kind of scared the shit out of me. Excuse me, it was like, I kind of just backed up and I just kind of like looked at him. I was... Like you're seeing a ghost. Yeah, yeah, because it was exactly, yeah, like him. Uh, yeah, we just had some uh, 
it seems like the shit calls always seem to kind of like haunt you. I made a comment to somebody one time. I said that, uh, you know, living by myself um, or anybody, it's just like that. You know, you could put on this good face. I'm up at the Allison with J-Lo, you know, we're screwing around, drinking, I'm checking all this women out, got my marker out, going to see him, going Sharpie on. And uh, you put that good smile on that. Man, that guy's got it together. He's all right. You go in the house and you close that door. You know, the close of that door sometimes just changes a person's. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like a false sense, you know, you're giving those people thinking, you know, there's nothing wrong. So I never really judged anybody because I had a rough time with some stuff. And uh, to you're in their shoes, you know, you don't know what they're thinking, what they go through. Uh, we had a bad call in Steelton in the alley. Diana Watson, Diana Watts Smith, six year old. Was living on South Second Street that time, come in, uh, it was early morning. They had refurbished a garage right off of um, Pine Street and Steel, right off the front, the first alley there, I guess they referred to as River Alley. I had parked at the Turkey Hill. Uh, I POV'd Gino and I, Chief of uh, Gene Vance, Chief 50 of there, Steelton, knew me and respected me, and we got along, and I asked him if it's all right that, you know, that I could uh, just POV. So I took old Thunderbolt. That's back when I had Thunderbolt grease slapper. Some guys that would listen to this might know. Parked at Turkey Hill and went straight across. Had my coat in my hand, put my helmet on, and never even looked for cars because I could look through the alleyway there by the old Woolworths and see the glow. And I go running up there, first on the scene. I encounter the mother. And she screamed, my baby, my baby. And I grabbed her and, you know, I said, you know, where's, who's there? Who's this? You know, is there somebody in there? And here was her little, uh, her daughter. And uh, at that point in time, the engine was just coming up in Jean. But that first couple seconds of um, helplessness. Um, I mean, just, yeah, it leaves, you think about it now, it leaves you with a sorrowful heart. It just, uh, That one really uh, fucked with my head. I don't want to use that language here a lot, but um, if I use that, I think you'll get to the point what I'm thinking of. Because the first thing that flashed in my mind was Danny and Jesse, my daughters. We hear mom come out the front or jumped out and the daughter goes around the other way thinking to get her mom. Mom come out one side, she goes around. At that point in time, I looked there you had fire blowing out the door, two windows, it was an old garage. Uh, yeah, it was consumed, boom, quick. Pulled the line off, I mean, there was, in, I didn't even have a pack, I was, yeah, I just had my gear on, not that that would have stopped me, but it's um, kind of like a reality check, you know. There's a certain time over the years, uh, if you've experienced different fires, there's certain things you get to know um, when the possibility of somebody getting out, you know, is going to make it. Uh, what the amount of fire we had going on, uh, took a line off. I had my old little buddy, um, oh man, I can't even think of his name, the old black guy that we had there. Uh, and I don't want to pick a race thing or nothing but black guy. Um, yeah, because he said he couldn't dance, he couldn't. He said, I'm not a regular black guy. Man, that's terrible. I could see him face now, and I can't think of him. It come to me. So he pulled a line. I said, I yanked the line. He was fixing up his pack. We hit it. Uh, the electric was blowing right at that time. Never tripped the fuse yet. The sparks were flying. I said, come on, we're going right in. They're going to hit this, knock this down. Until uh, we got in, and uh, yeah, the outcome was not good. Actually, I think there were some guys from 32 that come in. Uh, it was a tight, confined area. And that at the secondary search, they had found her, but up in the bedroom and stuff where she was wedged between there was kind of piled up with stuff. And it wasn't a very big place that I'm sure they didn't. And I'm not here to put anybody down, but I'm sure they didn't have a lot of, um, you know, room for stuff. And that she was probably just trying to hide herself for wedge or maybe a smoke overcame her. But there's two things about that call that aggravated me. You know, this bullshit, 
with uh, social media. Everybody can get on there, put their space based stuff and put that out there, but never say who they are. You know, but they want to put all this stuff on there. All oh, those guys are fat, overweight, out of shape. That's why they didn't get in there to get her. Uh, that was hard for me to accept because I don't think I'm fat, over shape, out of, uh, or out of, uh, out of shape, overweight. I always try to take care of myself. Uh, but it's easy for somebody to put that stuff on a computer or put that out there on Facebook and, you know, not stand behind their real name. And uh, that was a hard pill to swallow. I had that one, I talked to Gino and Gino knew I was having a tough time and getting back to my buddy to cut man, Ski come up and Ski come up to talk to me. Because it, uh, it was hard. That little girl was also um, my little cousin's classmate, Cheyenne. And Cheyenne uh, asked me, her dad runs, Barry runs in a fire company out in the township. And Cheyenne, at six years old, seven years old, they couldn't comprehend that, you know, why she had to die. And uh, she gave me a little stuffed animal. It's a little uh, angel. Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray my soul of the Lord to keep. Pray my soul of the Lord to keep. You know, if I die before I wake, and I still have that, and I played that until the battery went out on it. But that kind of helped me through it. But I just told Cheyenne, I said that. Uh, I said God needed another little angel, and I said He picked Diana. I said so. If you're ever down and out, I said that's a friend or that's somebody you can always pray to and talk to. I said she'll always be over you. And then in talking to Ski, what they taught those guys in Philly was I over E. Because Ski said to me, he said, first thing I know, he said, yo, Holmes, he said, I know the kind of firefighter you are. He said, I know what you're made of. I said, uh, what they tell us is intelligence over emotions. Well, you're looking to see. Um, you know, there's just some calls. If you've been in the fire service long enough, you're going to get to know, and you're going to get to know those calls. When you get there, you know, that's the card you're dealt. Uh, you're going to know that um, that's not... I just can't change. Correct. You being a battalion chief. You know, your, your thing in your heart and your guys that you work with, you know, their thing is they want to go do their best. They want to give it their all. Uh, and there's a time that you got to kind of reel them back and then for the safety's sake, do we want to lose one of ours? Uh, and that's the way Ski talked to me. He said, the emotion is the hard part. He said, that's where you got to put the intelligence. You got to keep your wits together. So I still draw that circle and I try to tell people that. And I kind of made up my own little thing where the I over the E. And uh, there's some guys that I talked to because we had some other shit calls after that. There's some calls that... Um, yeah. Yeah, Scotty Allen and I were involved with over in Bressler. That little girl, Autumn, made it and uh, her brother and sister didn't. But when I was in Scott in the ambulance there looking at that, I mean, it was look, like an in, looking in two uh, dark holes, like two tunnels. Her little eyes black. I mean, it looks like I could, it looked like a scary movie. I mean, that you could see forever in this little, yeah, Scotty's holding her trying to, revive her, give her oxygen, and uh, yeah, she made it, but it's, that's one thing, there's sometimes I close my eyes and I just see that, it's almost like one of them Chucky movies or something, where you see like, their eyes are like charcoal, I mean, it's black, it's like you can look right to the devil. Um, those are the hard ones. Um, like you, you have a sweet wife, that's a uh, special thing, that you can go home, you know, you got somebody to grab, uh, somebody to hug, somebody to talk, somebody to cry with, you know, to get your emotions out. Because to hold it in, I was always a hard head. I, um, <clears throat> Still a bit of that way. Me? I am. Uh, 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 another special good friend that I had that I could talk to is uh, Mike Kurtz. He works for Lifeline, and we've been friends since mid-90s. I probably put him through the ringer more than uh, I've helped him because I put him through some crap there with some health issues and heart issues. Him and his son Ryan, uh, but he was one I could talk to and 
yeah, very humble guy, just, you know, not there for the limelight to talk all this trash, kind of step back and you go do your job. But this, you know, the important thing to stress is, you know, if you've got somebody to talk to. Now they offer this counseling. I know Skull and I, we used to talk about that, and he said, man, we go home, buy a six-pack of Schmitz or beer or whatever cheap stuff we could get, go in our bedroom, crack the stereo up, and, you know, drink it out of you, try to, yeah. try to wash it out. You know, now we're fortunate enough to... Uh, that type of stuff is more organized now. The efforts and... Yes. Which is good. It is, but till somebody that's teaching that class that never went through anything like that, uh, yeah, I it's, imagine, you know. it's a tough one. <clears throat> but yeah, there's, uh, there's some crappy, yeah, crappy calls. But there's one fortunate, and you know, it kind of pissed some people. That's going back in the end hut days. That I made a rescue there in Pakistan. Two babies and a grandma. Met up with the police chief. Everybody sitting outside watching this go on and said, is there anybody in there? I just parked my work van. and told my helper to go run over Pakistan Station, start blowing the siren, tell him I got a working fire here on Kelso Street. So I go running right in and grandma's in a chair, kitchen's off. Uh, Little one uh, was 18 month and a three year old. The three year old was in a tub naked. This was in uh, December, January, cold. Picked her up out of there, naked, threw her in the bed, wrapped her in a towel or in a blanket, took off to the neighbor, banged on her door, said, Here, take this little one, and walked back in, got the other one. Cop was coming and uh, got the grandma, walked the grandma out. I took the other little one, uh, the 18 month that was laying right in the bed there. But, um, Brother had nominated me for a uh, heroism award through Firehouse Magazine, and that kind of uh, kind of that thing with clicking with the three brothers, it kind of pissed some people off, and, and you get recognized in a magazine like that. I didn't, yeah, I didn't give it a thought, but it's um, Pakistan was having their banquet coming up. And Todd Swigert, which was Chief 40, when he was running the pizza shop, our old shop there where I worked, was beside there. And I come in, and they said, about the banquet, are you a member? I said, oh, yeah, I should be a member. Yeah, I did something here. And I said, I'll just print you a copy and give you this paper article. We're here. You know, that's another generation spread. Maybe that's why you were such a hard ass on me, you know, to get my head out of my ass and, you know, to sit down and talk about some stuff. It's like the World War II heroes. You know, they don't want to talk, and I was just always kind of quiet and humble and just did my thing. And until Todd realized that, that group of guys come in, never knew that. So they had found the, uh, the fire chief and uh, myself, and they had a banquet. And I didn't think anything of us. Why is Chuck Stauffer coming? You know, why is Pesky coming to this? And I'm thinking, all right. Well, here, those guys were on a high spire at the time, and I was a member of Pakistan. Uh, so I went to the banquet, not realizing what was going to happen there, and uh, it was humbling because it reminded me of a uh, World War II veteran that did, you know, the years had gone by, and I was never looking for anything. Mm -hmm. uh, Craig Powers was actually working, uh, I guess, with County at that time, and he had tried to find the girls or find their like their whereabouts to see if they could come there and. Uh, present those plaques. They had given myself one and then to the police chief. And uh, yeah, they couldn't get them. But like I said, I was never look I was never looking for anything, never, you know, never thought of it that way. Yeah. But uh, there's calls, uh, you know, that haunt you probably till the day you die. There's certain things that strike it up, there's certain things that happen. I just wish I had more time with Brother Joe, because uh, we'd be at each other's throat. And uh, yeah, the room I'm sitting in, my little fire room, uh, that's the old alarm board out of the camp curtain, which if you'd ever see on the top of it, it says camp curtain number 12. 
that was before the Allison was two and they rejuvenated everything and made Allison 12 and then they bumped us to 13. So everybody said there was never a 12. So that's kind of how that story goes. <laughs> but it was probably a month or so, six weeks before my brother Joe had passed away. Um, I have a little memorial corner here. I told him, I said, this is going to be my memorial area. I said, guys that I fought fire with, you know, that had passed. And I said, I don't want them to be forgotten. Actually, that diamond plate come off of a uh, ladder truck out of Philadelphia. It's written on the bottom. The cut man kind of borrowed it and uh, kind of made good sense, good use for it. But the, yeah, if there's a day goes by, I could, you know, have Joe back. But I can look at it now because uh, my nephew, Glenn Rodensky, got on a job here in Harrisburg in uh, 2018. So Joe will kind of carry on, uh, hopefully, the legacy. There were, I don't know if it's always a good thing, but there were, well, it depends which one. The other guys were like always humble. I was always a black sheep. I was like the kind of wild one in the group. Kind of, uh, yeah, Johnny Rebel type thing. But hopefully Glenn, you know, we can make things happen with him. He seems to be excited. Uh, so I just want to stay positive and keep him going. He's doing good. He's doing good, but he's fresh out the gate. Yeah, hey, yeah, still a little bit wet behind the ears. I just keep him, uh, yeah, keep him on edge, Joe. Just if he has some good guys, then there are definitely some good guys. There definitely is. Uh, it's definitely a change. You got a good group of aggressive guys, and that's what he was concerned about. That's what he wanted. Uh, where you guys pre plan You're going out and check other buildings. You're checking things over. Uh, Stay kind sharp. Of, yes, kind of preventive. Instead of sitting, do to do to do to do, wait, you know, till something happens, and uh, you know, by then it it can get too ugly. Yeah, because when you're going to go into something, you you may not be ready for it, or you always you expect. You don't want to be trying to figure shit out after the beep went off. No, you yeah. Try to expect the unexpected. Yes, try to expect the unexpected. Yeah. I always tell the young guys, no tunnel vision, go in wide open. I said, this day and age, you don't know what you're running into. I want to go in with you. I said, nope. I said, I don't wear an air pack. Air packs are for pussies. I said, uh, and I don't want to have to drag somebody else out. So please, Glenn, don't do as I did. Do as I'm saying, though. Air packs are good. You want to wear those things. So, yeah. I want to see, I want to see you around. Yes, I want to see you around for a long time. Plus now, then, there might be another little Rodensky, my little grandson, Wyatt, my buddy. Uh, yeah, maybe he, because he likes fire trucks, diggers, dump trucks, place. trains. Because what helped me get through some of that crap time, I had my old coat, and I always had my daughter sign something. Uh, Danny and Jesse always make little phrases or whatever, and Scotty Allen was taken back by that time when it read on the back, because Danny wrote on there. You know, Dad, be safe. Make sure somebody always has your back. And I thought that was pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. And Jesse, you know, Dad, be safe. Love you. But we can thank Mr. Pesky for that one time on the turnpike. Jesse had her little Furby. And he said, hey, we ain't got enough guys. I said, I got my daughters. He said, come on, we'll take them. <laughs> so there we are in the old pen fab going down. Jesse's holding her ears. Danny was loving it, looking out, watching, you know, seeing everything. Danny, Jesse's holding their ears, the Furbies, and they were activated by noise, and that pen fab was loud, and that thing, blah, 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 the whole time talking. Oh, uh, what I put Danny and Jesse through sometime. Uh, I think it might have been mad at me, but, um, well, maybe not mad, but as they get older now, we can talk and appreciate things, so. Yeah. Because then they lost their uh, buddy we had down there. We had Jason Delancey, a young kid. Uh, that was a shit call. That was ugly. My brother George was actually driving the rescue when that wreck happened in front of Dairy Queen up there on the Front Street, which was actually that section still sort our township. And that was a hard one to tell Dan and Jesse about. Uh, yeah, that's crappy because they were his buddy. And matter of fact, Ski has one of his finger rosaries in there. and. Uh, Jason was just such a good kid and he carried on with Danny and Jesse and played and they just mm -hmm. almost like the big brother type thing so they definitely had a good time with them for the short time that we had them but you know sad thing is 
we're all going to lose somebody we really love, we dearly love, and uh, yeah. So I think that's what Jason was after me to get this done or get this uh, get the stories out, or at least tell a little bit of you know what I went through. And I'm sure there's some stuff that uh, can't remember and didn't remember, or sometimes you know you don't want to remember, but. Um, you're like a ghost. I've been chasing you for two years. <laughs> two? It might be about like three. Yeah. yeah trying and, to get Frank, then you pop up and you have a and poor, slash on your face with a black Sharpie marker. And poor Sharpie has been after me. He was fed up with me. But, um, no, hopefully the young guys that I, you know, help instill some things with. Uh, well, just like you, you know, we're listening to... JR and some of these different people and I mean I'm sure Pesky and you know these got Skull these guys are you know they're influenced by you I mean Skull has homes on the back of his goddamn coat uh, well, where did he get that from <laughs> I mean you know there's I'm I know that you've influenced a lot of people Walmart but, yeah <laughs> but uh you know, and, trying to get you to talk and, and trying to get you in one spot for a second. Yes. But, um... Uh, very private. There's certain things that I'm... Uh, I know it's hard to believe, you know, you get to know me, but I said that's like the other side when the door goes shut. You know, just very private and yeah. quiet and personable about some things. Because I never felt myself up here when I was an officer and them guys, well, you're a chief. I said, dude, I'm just... Pretend I got a pink helmet on, a blue helmet, whatever. I said, don't look at it as a white helmet. I said, I never felt like that. I said, we're going to do this together as a team. Uh, and that's when I kind of got away from the thing by myself. But, yeah. you know, we tried to instill in these guys, hey, you know, you always ain't going to have a gang of guys with you sometime. Yeah, yeah. It might be you, yeah. you know, one other guy. So I'm going to work with you. But don't think of me as the chief. I said, I never thought that. I said, I just wanted to be one of the regular guys, one of the everyday guys. Yeah. You know, and just. And you can, I mean, you can only do so much. Correct. And I just I tell the guys, you know, when when you're put in that position to do as much as you can, you know, make sure you can do as much as you can. You don't want to leave nothing on the table. Correct. You know, you don't want to be laying in bed thinking about, you know what, I should have done this or uh, you you do that anyway, but you don't want to have something blatant like you, you know, your physical ability or something like that. It's a tough job, you know. Probably one of the hardest parts of the job is staying physically fit to do the job. Yes. I mean, um, you know, and that's all part of it. Um, so. Nowadays they have the, uh, you know, the equipment and stuff. Back then we didn't have that stuff. Oh, yeah. No. I mean. It's, we did the steps and carried on and oh, run yeah. and put hose on and pulled stuff around. Yeah. It's nice now. I mean, you know. The stations, can, you know, you have air conditioner. Man, we went. Them old rigs were open calves, man. You were fighting raindrops. Uh, I was in, uh, yeah, what some guys went through right there after the, uh, you know, the riots when they were throwing bricks, rocks, and bottles and all that crap at them. The only thing we had to worry about was raindrops, snow, and whatever else come at you. Yeah. I remember Pop Pop, Dick Cray, telling me some stories that they had. And yeah. yeah. There's my buddy there. He's one. Uh, Look, I've been he's, after him too. He's probably still mad at me because that time we did their standby for their banquet and we went out the door and they were out in front of the apron air talking and uh, uh, that was a group there from Ice Buyer guys we were out there for their standby for their banquet and then pop up you know was uh, there and they walked out in the apron and we come out in the engine on four bay there and uh, they had the dignitaries from Susquehanna Township there and all of a sudden the rig goes by and this arm comes out the window and salutes everybody like this and pop up goes Oh my God, who was that? So we went in the car and came back and, uh, yeah. To the state pump. Yeah, Dick, I still love you, buddy. Because you were one of the few that always call me on my birthday and tell me happy birthday. So uh, I have to dig in the dumpster at Dunkin' Donuts and get you an extra donut. It's a special for you. <laughs> That's our standing joke. But... Uh, I don't know, I think I'm about, uh, I'm sure there'll be other stories I can think of. You got nothing else on your list there? You, did you cover all your stuff, your important stuff? 
Yeah, because the friendships you make along the way always keep at, like the Gary Shannon, Gary That's Neff. Not a, not a good two. Buck. Uh, I always, we always go back and forth to each other as ex-captain eight from ex-captain 13, because we were both the captains at that time frame. Um, you know, you got like Tommy Murray, there's guys, there's so many, uh, Jimmy Metcalf ran up at 13, uh, the Hoyer, Scott, and Bill. Uh, God, I'm gonna, um, yeah, I'm gonna leave out some guys, you know, my old buddy Chuck Stafford, you know, you got Gino up here at Steelton. You know, back in those days, you had the Ventura brothers, Ralph and, Ralph and Sam, uh, Jimmy Talgen. There's some good guys that come out of there. The old guys from the west side, the Sweden brothers, they, they could wheel and deal that stick. Though. They were some good guys. Uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, that part I wouldn't trade for the world. Uh, when you're kind enough and you invite me up to the Allison, you know, I always get a warm welcome. You know, it's always definitely a good thing. And there's one thing I will always remember you for, Jason, because uh, first anniversary of my brother, Joe Passon, you called me on that day just to let me know or ask me how I was doing. And uh, that meant a lot. And there's, um, you know, it's something you kind of understand a brotherhood, and I think that's where some of these guys wandered away and, you know, lost that. It's not always about me, 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 I, I. It's, you know, it's a brotherhood. It's a group of guys. And just remember, the paths you burn, you can't get that back when you screw guys over, you know. So you present how you want to be treated, you know, it comes back to you. Because I know I'm a little nuts and whacked. We all are. And that, yeah. So in... Uh, you know, and this Aaron and everybody that knows me, like Big Papa, Byron and Brian, you know, they wanted to know. This is my, like, security thing. Because I'll make a promise to you guys, when I go, I'm going to have some of these at my casket. So. I think you're probably going to have a mark on your face. When the family's gone, yeah, and they close me off there, you know, I'm going to give the guys that I got over the years a chance to get me back. But I'm going to step up just one second, so don't go anywhere. I can still talk to you. Still got my glasses. Because uh, there's this guy I know that's working on this old firehouse, and I always ask him something, and he always busts my chops about it. I know it probably ain't a whole lot, and, you know, I don't know. It got a little dust on it, and he might have a couple, or I don't know. He may not even want it. But I told him. And he always busts my chops, I told you that name before. You know, kind of just like him always wanting me to interview him and I wanted to make sure I got the right thing. So Jason Robert Lloyd, 76, holy Christ, 78. Is that the year you were born? No, it can't be. That is. All right, that is 76, 78. Okay, there's F4, 10, 7, 15, 10, 17, 15. Something happens to me, this Allison Fire Department house and helmet goes to Jason R. Lloyd, signed Frank Rodensky. So at this time, you're going to take us home tonight, buddy. I know it's just a little something, and I know i got some other things, but uh, you've been kind of special. And you always treated me with the utmost. You were never thought of yourself as, uh, you know, you're a paid guy, and I, pres I respect your position. <laughs> I respect your position and, uh, you know, that's your job, that's your dedication. And uh, what you're trying to do to the Allison and with these interviews to save a piece of history. Um, when we're young, we don't think of it that way. And now I can kind of see when they talk to the older fellows, like from the wars. You know, if we don't get that inner, uh, we don't get those interviews, we don't get them stories, we don't get that. I said, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. Uh, there's guys I wish I could talk back over to again. First off, my dad. Um, you know, I was only two when he left, when he passed away, but, um, you know, I just wish I could. Hopefully he's proud of me when he looks down and sees what I do. Uh, for my brother Joe, who George, Joe, and I fought, you know, and we, oh, yeah, boy. But, um, you know, if I could get that back, Hedrick, 
the Dutchman. He was in my wedding. We were drunk to get, yeah. But I love George Head to death. He, yeah, just a good dude. Just a great guy. Rick Moyer, Jack Payne, you know, the black cat, Ben Newsom. Uh, Santoro, uh, you know, these guys that uh, I fought fire with, Sopranic. You know, but just as a young kid, you know, still wet behind the ears. Uh, and there's probably many more that I wish I could, you know, I could think of. Jason Delancey was one of them. Uh, Jimmy Yon, a young kid from High Spire. Not at the fire service, but he died for our country in, uh, over in Afghanistan. So with that, Jason, I'd um, like to give you this. I know it's uh, probably not the high eagle and everything else or whatever, but... Uh, I told you there, I had that and I always made that note because it's in there and hopefully uh, you keep it, buddy. Love you, dog. I Thank love you, you, buddy. You're love more than you. welcome. Just, uh, there's a little dust, so don't put that part um, of it there. I'll we'll wipe it off. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome, but... Um, I'm going to leave that note in there, too. Yeah, to you, your wife, Tara, you know, the kids and what you're doing. Just keep it up. Uh, and thank you. I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of taken back and humbled that, uh, you know, you asked me because I never thought of myself, uh, you know, as anything special. Just wanted to go do my job. Well, I think that's why, uh, you know, why we chase you so much, you know. There's like, like I said earlier, JR, um, you know, even though you're not active anymore, you know, Skull, you know, listen, the, the people that people look up to now, who are they talking about? And it's always Ski and Frankie and, you know, I was like, I got to get Frank. I'm just chasing him forever. And I remember even back when I first moved up in 97, 98, we were at Dolphin County Convention. We were somewhere and uh, the Peskies were right, like, make a sign up for Ski. And I was like, what? <laughs> and, <laughs> and here comes Frank. <laughs> and I was like, oh my Ski. God. Ski. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As the old Diener brothers, Big oh, Scott would Scott say. And Sammy. Yeah, Scott would say, oh yeah, he goes by Ski because he couldn't spell toboggan. <laughs> <laughs> Those two guys, yeah, were great. Oh, and the legend, Ben Gevers, a coxman. Mm -hmm. You know, and you had Wacko Wayne, Shazula. Yeah. Keith. I scared him, he invited me to graduation. He's probably thinking, did I make a mistake? <laughs> and then you had John Brindle. Uh, matter of fact, his dad taught me my first class when I was 16 there at Enhut. Thin man. Oh, yep. Jack Payne was there, John Brindle, and uh, man, I could see the face and I can't think of the name. And then I got sick the one time and got kidney stones and Skull, we were out there that one night. Skull says, oh, you probably got gas. And yeah, just take some Digel or Pepto. And I hated Pepto. So lo and behold, we end up going up to, uh, there we go again. That was Mike Kurtz. We come up on a Sunday morning. He takes me up there, um, Polly, when Polly was open. And who took care of me? Jane Brindle. Yeah. She was such a, God, she was such a sweetheart. I loved her. She was. Just such a good person. And John, yeah, John's just a good dude. <laughs> John's the first one that offered my daughter Danny, hey, you want to try some of this chew? Them guys used to get that peach and cherry. Danny goes, hey, this is good. I'm going, 14 years old, I'm going, Danny, don't go home and tell your mom that you tried that. Was going to, oh, God, that was up at, uh, I was up at Hack, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, Danny, don't, please don't get sick. Don't start throwing. <laughs> Dad, this is good. I want to try some more. I'm going, no. But Danny's my buddy, yeah, she was, yeah, the rebel without a cause. She wanted to join the firehouse and yeah, it just didn't work out. But she knew what it did and yeah. I told her certain guys, you gotta have balls to do this. And that's a sign phrase that them guys from uh, West Milford told us, you can't teach balls. Yeah. Neither got it or you don't. Cause my buddy sporty, Ron Gibbler, we, we, yeah. All right, Ron, I love you, buddy. Cause some of the stuff there, that'd be a whole nother, uh, that'd be a whole nother video. half hour video, yeah. 
But uh, no, thank you for your time. I am humbled by this and uh, I just appreciate no, what you, you did and what you do and I hope, uh, you know, I hope, I hope they like, up. yeah, but I hope they like this video. No, I think we, I think they'll love it. So Merry Christmas to everybody and a healthy, good, happy new year. Be safe out there.